Good morning, church family. Can we all stand together as many as you already have? How we doing this morning? Ready to worship the Lord? Online church family, welcome to you. Worship with us wherever you are this morning. Let's open up in prayer. God, we thank you, Lord. We thank you, God, for this beautiful day, Lord, that you have made, Lord. May we rejoice and be glad in it, God. Would you have your way even now as we lift our voices and our shouts to you, Lord, as we clap our hands unto you, Lord, would you get the glory? We thank you for what you have done, God. Have your way this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. We all said, amen. You saw Satan fall like lightning. You make darkness run for cover. But the miracle that I just can't get over, my name is registered in hell. I believe in signs and wonders. I have a resurrection power. The miracle that I just can't get over My name is registered in hell Oh, my praise belongs to you forever This is, this is my testimony From death to life Cause grace we wrote my story I'll testify By Jesus Christ the righteous I'm justified this is my testimony, this is my testimony. Yeah. Come together, sons and daughters, born with blood and washed in water. Sing the praises of the Spirit, Son and Father, our God. What he started. Oh, our God will finish what he started. This is my testimony from death to life. Because grace we wrote my story. I testify by Jesus Christ the righteous. I'm justified. This is my testimony. This is my testimony. work of Christ yes. if I'm not dead you're not done greater things are still to come oh I believe if I'm not dead you're not done Lord greater things are still to come oh I believe oh I'm not dead you're not done greater things testimony from death to life cause grace we wrote my story I testify by Jesus Christ the righteous I'm justified this is my testimony Yes, you are God. 
God of Abraham, God of Abraham, you're the God of covenant and faithful promises. And time and time again, you have proven you do just what you say. Though the storms may come and the winds may blow, I will remain steadfast. And then my heart burn when you speak a word, it will come to pass. Everybody sing it out. Great. Great is your faithful. Let's sing it to him, church.
pouring out my life, gracefully flowing. Here I am, God, arms wide open. We're yours, Lord, we're yours, God. Pouring out my life, gracefully Our prayer to the Lord. Here I am, God, arms wide open, pouring out my life, gracefully broken. Oh, trust you, Lord. Here I am. place, Lord God, to be than in your arms, God. Even when you de desire to, to prune, Lord, or allow us to go through the trials of life, Lord, you're still with us, Lord Jesus. And what growth you bring through breaking, Lord. And we just praise you, Lord, that we're in your arms this morning. Not forsaken us. You're with us, Lord. You're on the throne. You're moving mightily, Lord. So would you continue that work, Lord, that you've begun this morning, Lord? Praise you that we can sing out to you, Lord. Have your way in all things we pray. In Jesus' name we all said, Amen. Amen. Let's give the glory to the Lord this morning, church. Amen. And happy Sunday to everybody. You may have a seat if you're here with us in the house. Welcome to our online church family. Thank you so much for joining us wherever you are. Let's check out this morning's announcements and see what's coming up. Hi, everyone, and welcome to Calvary Chapel, Chino Valley. Before we begin today's teaching, we'd like to share some exciting things coming your way. So let's get into our announcements. We invite you to be with our church family for Christmas at Calvary Chapel, Chino Valley. Join us as we joyfully celebrate the birth of our Savior, Jesus Christ. We will be hosting a beautiful time of worship, meaningful fellowship, and special teachings by Pastor David Rosales on Christmas Eve and Christmas Day. Our Christmas services will begin at 7 p.m. on Christmas Eve and 9 a.m. on Christmas Day. We are excited to spend this Christmas season with you. All are welcome, and we encourage you to invite your family and friends. From Friday, December 10th through Sunday, December 12th, we will be sending a team to Capilla Calfario, Mexicali. There, they will help deliver our Christmas gift boxes to the children and help in sharing the greatest gift this Christmas season, the gospel message of Jesus Christ. If you would like to join us, information is available at the gazebo and at the church office during the week. If you would like to provide one or more gift boxes for a child in Mexicali this Christmas, all wrapped and labeled boxes are due back to the church no later than Sunday, December 5th. Please gift wrap your shoebox or plastic shoebox, lid wrapped separately, and use the label we provide. More information is available at calvaryccv.org under the events page. Ladies, mark your calendar for his name, our Karis Christmas Coffee. The Christmas Coffee takes place Saturday, December 4th from 9 to 11.30 a.m. on our CCV campus. Our festive morning will begin with Christmas music and carolers on the patio and in the banquet hall. As you fellowship, enjoy coffee and the original world-famous Cinnabon. After our time of fellowship, we are elated to welcome Sandy McIntosh as our guest speaker. You will also enjoy Christmas worship led by Kayla Wiseman. Tickets will cost $12 and are available online only. Check our webpage for more details. Celebrate alongside your church family at our annual Thanksgiving feast on Thursday, November 25th at 11 a.m. in the banquet hall. The meal will feature a time of worship, devotion, and fellowship alongside others who call Calvary Chapel Chino Valley their home church. This event is free, but you must sign up to bring a dish to secure your seat. If you would like to attend or would simply like to bless others, please come to the gazebo after service or to the church office during the week to sign up. Invite a friend. Tamale season is here and we have a new tamale recipe for you to try this year. 
Starting today and every Sunday through December 19th, we will be set up in the center of the courtyard after services for you to place your orders. All proceeds will go towards our junior high and high school retreats and events in 2022. Please support our youth by ordering some delicious tamales and get them while they last. Before we continue the service, please take a moment to silence your cell phone and to limit distractions, we ask that you please stay in your seat until service is over. For more information on events, registration, or opportunities to serve, be sure to visit our website at calvaryccv.org. Thank you for being with us and have a blessed week. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Calvary Chapel Chino Valley. If this is your first time here. I want to say welcome and God bless you. I want to welcome those who are joining us online and for those who may be in the patio this morning. Before we get into some of more of our announcements, uh, we like to spotlight a ministry from time to time. And this morning, we're going to spotlight a ministry called Angel Tree. And Deborah, who's going to come out here in a, in a moment, Deborah has become a dear sister to me. Uh, matter of fact, she does a lot of work with uh, uh, women in the prison ministry. Uh, in January, we'll be starting something, a new work with that, but that will be for another time. But this morning, we've asked Deborah Sailors to come on up and share a little bit about the Angel Tree program. So why don't we give a warm welcome to Deborah Sailors. Oh, hi, good morning, church family. The prophet Isaiah writes, uh, the spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted and to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prisons to those who are bound. Uh, church family, my name is Deborah Sailors, and I'm the Angel Tree Coordinator here at our church. And on behalf of the prison ministry, I want to thank Pastor David right now for giving us permission to do our third uh, <laughs> Angel Tree. Thank you. <clears throat> According to the United States Bureau of Statistics, the 2.7 million American children have a parent in prison. That's one in every elementary classroom. Some are so young that they don't even understand why mom or dad is gone and it's not their fault. In 1982, a former prisoner named Mary Kay Beard started Angel Tree, and caring friends like you have delivered more than 10 million gifts to girls and boys with a mom or dad in prison, along with, more importantly, this, uh, the gospel of Jesus Christ. The Angel Tree program creates a pathway for incarcerated parents to restore and to strengthen relationships with their children and family members and we as a church, uh, we serve as that bridge. <clears throat> Angel, Tree is, uh, Angel Tree is under the umbrella of Prison Fellowship, and it is the world's largest Christian nonprofit organization that ministers to prisoners, former prisoners, and their families. In addition, it is a leading advocate for justice reform and was founded by Chuck Colson in 1976. He believed that a restorative approach to prisoners, former prisoners, and all of those affected by crime and incarceration can make communities safer and healthier. Their ministry is founded on the conviction that all people are created in God's image and that no life is beyond reach. With each gift we deliver, we also share the gospel, which in return can begin a cycle of redemption that positively impacts the rest of their lives. And on behalf of their incarcerated parents, this simple act lets prisoners' children know that their parents love them and have not forgotten them. I myself was incarcerated. A lot of you know my testimony. My mom was incarcerated, and I know firsthand the transformation that can happen from the Word of God. But it's not the gifts or even my testimony that changes lives, church family. It's only the gospel and the power of Jesus Christ that will change anybody's life. I'm just a vessel. Our last Angel Tree event in 2019, because last year we couldn't uh, for uh, COVID restrictions, I had mentioned Dawn. Her brother Michael was incarcerated, and he signed up her for Angel Tree along with the family. And I still see and speak to Dawn all the time. And she has been coming to church and even went to one of our single mother's events that year. Cheryl's family is another example. She's up here too. Um, the first time I met her was in 2018 at our first party. We served them along with five of their children. Her family photo is there. Esther and her daughter, who is coming again this year, um, with their children. I communicate with Cheryl. She's, um, she's going to be doing 12 years. The first time she was in Twin Towers and I sent her pictures, I was able to send her a photo that was taken here at the party, and I'll never forget the gratitude she had for our church family. I now wish to extend that and to thank you guys for that too. And last but never least, um, I, I want to mention a woman named Helen. 
She lives right here in Chino. She's a grandmother, caregiver for her son Frankie, who is in prison. She and I connected so well after an angel tree delivery that when Frankie was released, I was able to get him into a rehabilitation program, and he is now doing well with his life. He's a truck driver who drives out of state. Um, Helen is here today with her children. Um, Frankie, Jackie, and Selena, and they will be helping me serve at the tables out here after um, service, each one. This year, we have approximately 50 families with 136 children. And a party for these children and their caregivers is going to be December 11th at 2 p.m. in the 500 building. These kids will be participating in a Christmas craft with some of our children's ministry team, while the caregivers will be hearing a testimonial and a skit from the high schoolers, worship, as well as team leaders from various ministries that here that will be praying and speaking to the very nature of our welcomed guests. If you're interested in purchasing a gift for a child or having any inquiries about serving either at the event the gift wrapping party, I'll be at the, some tables over here. Um, I know it's going to be real busy for the next few weeks, so if you're not able to participate, just pray, family, for um, all of the ministries, not just this one. And never forget what the Apostle Paul said, for the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor. Deborah and her team will be out there right next to the gazebo. You'll see some tables set out there. And again, if not able to participate, at least you can participate in prayer. And you know, when we're able to, when, when Jesus says, when I was hungry, you fed me. When I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. When I was in prison, you visited me. And Jesus, uh, the, 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 the sheep will say, well, when did you do this, Lord? And he said, if you've done it unto the least of my brethren, you've done it unto me. And so we have the privilege as a church to come together and to not only pray for all the other ministries, but to get involved. Uh, again, just a couple of announcements, you guys. Reminder that Wednesday evening, we have our Wednesday evening service, and Pastor David is taking us through the book of Titus. want to invite your friends and family to come on out. As mentioned already, Saturday, December 4th, from 9 a.m. to 11.30 a.m. is the Karis Christmas Coffee. Uh, there's a single mom's uh, Christmas dinner and boutique, which is going to be Friday, December 10th uh, fr from 6.30 to 9 p.m. Uh, it's for single moms or female guardians and their children. And then uh, church family, the single moms ministry, as our women's ministry has come alongside and, and has put the single moms ministry over their, under their umbrella, uh, they're looking for gift cards from the, our fellowship to donate to these single moms that they're able to I uh, have provisions for Thanksgiving and Christmas, and so uh, there's gift card suggestions such as gas station card, uh, gas cards, grocery store, restaurants, and Target, Walmart. You can drop off the gift cards if the Lord moves it upon your heart to do so. You can actually go to the gazebo and drop them off there. There's a representative there for our Karis ministry, and so if the Lord moves you into doing that, that is available as well. You know, and as we continue to worship, you know, I think about Acts chapter 3 when the man that was born lame had to be carried to the gate to beg. And every day he was there begging until he came across Peter and John. And Peter and John looked at him and they stared at him. They said, look, we don't have any money to give you, but what we do have to you, in the name of Jesus, get up and walk. And what's interesting is that this man who's never ever walked, he was built, he was placed by the temple gate to receive money because that was a big thoroughfare of traffic. He'd never been inside the temple, but it says that he got up and was leaping and walked into the temple and he was praising Jesus. I think about us this morning. Who would ever think that any of us would be at a church on a Sunday morning worshiping God until we've had an encounter with our living Savior, Jesus Christ, who now do we not only worship, but we glorify and honor his name. And I think about at one time that all of us may have been spiritually lame. And now that we worship Jesus, we're able to come here and say, Lord, thank you. And this morning, we have the privilege of worshiping the Lord through our tithes and our offerings. For those who are watching online, there's a, a chat box on YouTube and Facebook that has a link on it that you can click on, and it opens up a page to give our gifts to the Lord. We have agape boxes that are located here in the foyers that if you're here and brought your offering to the Lord, we're able to worship the Lord that way. 
But when we think about the, all the things that God has done for us, we will rejoice and glorify the Lord. Amen? So what I'd like to do is pray, and then we'll have another worship song. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for all the great things you have done in our lives, Lord. Times where spiritually we sat and begged, but today, Lord, you have set us free. And Lord, we're able to worship you through our song, we're able to worship through the word, and Lord, we're able to worship you through our giving. Lord, may you, your name be glorified and honored, Lord, that you may fill us with your Holy Spirit, that we may walk in its power. And Lord, we lift up our pastor this morning as he brings forth the message. We ask, that, Lord, that our lives will be transformed. Lord, we love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. And one more announcement before we get into the worship. There are tamales that are available for sale today after service. You may go to the tamale booth or the tamale tent and purchase your tamales. God bless you. He had to mention those tamales. Come on, John. Now we're all hungry. Let's all stand together, church family. This is a brand new song called Testify. I've been marked by your presence. This one thing I won't forget. Oh, how mercy went dirty. My life was spared I've been held by those nailed hands Through the lowest of nights And I'm no longer a dead man Now I walk in the light So testify God still provides Tell the truth If he's been good to you Raise a shout If he brought you out Everything with breath Sing praises Sing praises It's never a moment There was never
testify. So testify if God still provides. Tell the truth if He's been good to you. And raise a shout if He brought you out. Everything with breath, sing praise. Everything with breath. Sing praises. And Father, as you've gathered here, Lord, we do bless you. We do thank you, Lord, for everything that you have done for us, Lord, for bringing us here even at this moment. For those who are watching online, I, I pray that, Lord, your word would speak to us in a way to give us a, a sense of your power, your authority, your ability to deliver, and the fact that you are with us, Lord. I just ask that you would just, uh, even, even this morning, renew our, our desire to follow you. And so, Father, we just ask that you would bless this time in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Turn to your neighbor and say, God bless you. I'm glad you're here. Let's open our Bibles together. We're in uh, Mark's Gospel, chapter 5, Mark chapter 5. We're going to be looking today at verses 1 through 20. As you open your Bibles, I'd remind you that we do have our, our Catalyst Young, Men, Young Adults uh, Studies on Monday nights at 7.30 in the uh, Banquet Hall. Love to have you part of that. On Tuesday, we have a men's study. It starts at 6.30 in the morning. Fellas, we invite you to be part of that after the study. They usually eat something, a burrito or something, and uh, probably tamales for a while, huh? And uh, then we just, be we just began a new study in the book of Titus. Love to have you with us. We're there on Wednesday night. Uh, the study begins at 7 with worship. We get into the Word around 7.30, 7.35. So I invite you to be part of that as we uh, go through the book of Titus on Wednesday nights. And so uh, before I do my study, we're going to have a, a video that's going to be played, and then I'll share a couple things, then we'll get into our study. Let's play the video. I don't know if we have any vets or active service in the house this morning, but if we do, could you stand so we can honor you? There you go. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you for your service. Thank you for your service. We love you guys. 
Amen. Well, thank you. Yeah, I could talk about that for a moment, but I won't. We'll just say thank you, Jesus, for our veterans. Thank you for the freedoms we have through Christ. And uh, for those of you who served, you know, this nation is a greater nation because of you. And we love you. And we love you. We do. With that said, let's talk about demons for a while, shall we? We're in chapter 5 of the book of Mark. I'll begin by simply reading verse 1, and then I'll go into my introduction as I normally do. Looking at a severely demonized man who's referred to as Legion, and just to say this quickly before I get into our study, uh, Matthew records that there were actually two, but Mark uh, speaks of the one because this is the one who took the center of attention, and that's the reason why Mark concentrates on just the one, though Matthew in chapter 8 speaks of two men who met Jesus. And so, beginning at verse 1, reading verse 1 here in in Mark, rather, chapter 5, it reads, Then they came to the other side of the sea, to the country of the Gadarenes. So let's begin looking at this, because we're about to encounter a demonized man. And let me give you a background, a little information that will help us to understand what is taking place. We know that when Jesus began his ministry, he demonstrated his authority in a variety of ways. When we go back in in Mark's gospel and we see that he received baptism by John, uh, we know that he was identifying at that time with sinful men, but also as being anointed by the Spirit. And at that baptism, his father verbally spoke, identifying him as the one that he was pleased with. Immediately after, he had undergone severe temptations in the wilderness for 40 days. After victoriously withstanding Satan's temptations, we saw that he began to preach and he began to teach. And when he taught, the response to him was one of admiration, even amazement. He taught the people with an authority that no other rabbi had ever exercised. He showed his authority by his teaching as well as his preaching, but he also revealed it by his works of power because he performed many healings. Mark 1.34 says he healed many who were sick with various diseases. Not only did he heal many who were sick with illnesses, but he also cast out demons. Again in Mark 1, verse 34, that verse went on to say, and he cast out many demons. Various times Mark connects Jesus' healing of diseases with casting out demons. In chapter 3, verses 10 and 11, it, it says he healed many so that as many as had afflictions pressed about him to touch him. And the unclean spirits, whenever they saw him, fell down before him and cried out, saying, You are the Son of God. Now, why was Jesus healing? Why was he casting out demons? This was to uh, provide evidence that he is the Messiah. He had said in Luke 11, verse 20, If I cast out demons with the finger of God, surely the kingdom of God has come upon you. When he said, if I cast out demons with the finger of God, using that phrase, the finger of God, was to remind them of an Old Testament reference to God's power found in Exodus chapter 8. Jesus revealed his authority over Satan when Satan tempted him in the wilderness. After being tempted, Satan had said to him, fall down and worship me. Jesus responded, in chapter 4 of Matthew, verse 10, and said, Away with you, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only you shall serve. And verse 11 goes on to say, And the devil left him. So when Jesus ministered on earth, there was an unprecedented time of demonic activity. Satan's kingdom erupted in activity while Jesus walked on the earth. Demons cried out in recognition of him, knowing his power, knowing his authority. In Mark 1, 24, let us alone. What have we to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? Did you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. So the demons knew who he was. And as James later was to say in his epistle, they feared and they trembled. Now John tells us why Jesus came to planet Earth. In 1 John 3, verse 8, it says, Whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil, for the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. So as we have seen, 
throughout Mark, Jesus has continually cast out demons. It's been pointed out that this is the most dramatic example of him casting demons out found in Scripture. He's going to be dealing with a man of the Gadarenes. He's going to be dealing with legion. Now, we need to remember that the disciples have been working tirelessly. They've been next to Jesus as he's been performing his ministry. He's been teaching his men that ministry is work, that ministry has no set hours. And they needed to understand that their first priority was to minister the gospel to people. There would be times when they would rest, and there were times that Jesus would provide for this. He understood that they needed to rest, and he did make provision. In Mark 6, 31, it reads that he said to them, Come aside by yourselves to a deserted place and rest a while. For there were many coming and going, and they did not even have time to eat. And so they ministered quite a bit. And there are times when Jesus will be making provision for them. But even when Jesus set such a time apart for them, they would have their rest interrupted. Because it was after Jesus had said it's time to rest that he ended up feeding the 5,000. You see, his men needed to learn that ministry is an ongoing thing. It's like what Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 2 verse 9 when he says, You remember, brethren, our labor and toil for laboring night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you. We preached to you the gospel of God. So ministry is an ongoing thing. It's a continuous thing. And very often you don't find set hours as, as you serve the Lord. So, as at this point in, in Mark's gospel, Jesus' men have gone through a storm. And as we've seen, that storm caused them great fear. They're, they're physically and mentally exhausted. They've been active all day, active all night. They're cold. They're wet. It's late in the evening. They've been laboring. They're in need of rest. And they desire to arrive at the destination. But there's more to come. You see, the passage before us is going to give us insight into what has been called demon possession. When you look at this, let me give you some background. Again, develop it a little bit with you. Demons. What are demons? Well, demons are fallen angels. They sided with Lucifer when he rebelled against God. Revelation 12 verse 4 says that his tail swept a third of the stars out of the sky, flung them to the earth. That's a picture of fallen angels. They are now referred to as demons, also spoken of as evil spirits. And so we're going to be looking at Jesus in a very personal encounter here in chapter 5. Again, it's been said that this is the most vivid picture of demonic possession and how Jesus dealt with it that you're going to find in Scripture. One of the things that I'll say as I begin this now is this. I want to remind you of verse 35 in chapter 4. In verse 35 of chapter 4, it says, On the same day when evening had come, he said to them, Let us cross over to the other side. What does that tell us? Well, it tells us that he was planning to go to the Gadarenes, which if you were looking at a map and you had the, the Sea of Galilee, the Sea of Galilee would be on the north a little bit to the western side, and or rather Capernaum would be to the north on the western side, and they had gone south and to the east into a land called the, uh, the Gadara, the Gadarenes. So they had gone down a bit, and I'll be sharing more about that, but... Jesus had said, let us cross over to the other side. Why did he say that? It wasn't just to, to give the men some time to relax. It's because he has an appointment. You see this in Scripture, how that the Lord, and I'm beginning to start marking these things down, how the Lord will go to a certain place with a certain reason. We see that when he went to the, uh, the well there in Sychar in uh, John chapter 4, because he had an appointment to meet with a woman who is by the well. Well, here, Jesus has an appointment. He's going to be dealing with someone who is severely demonized. And so it says in verse 1, they came to the other side of the sea, to the country of the Gadarenes. So they land their boat, along with those other little boats that they had, and they exit 
onto the shore of, the, of Gadara. Gadara is on the eastern side, as I mentioned, of the Sea of Galilee. It's about six miles south, southeast of the city of Capernaum. This region that Jesus is now going to on the, uh, on the eastern side of the, uh, of the Sea of Galilee is called the Decapolis. It's called the Decapolis because they had ten cities there. It was mostly Gentile in population, sharing language, culture, and political status. Uh, they were dependent on Rome. It was the center of Greek and Roman culture, which may be the reason that they were raising pigs. In the area near the eastern shoreline were caves that were used for burial. The hills in the region descended to the Sea of Galilee, to the edge of the water. We've been to the to this area many times, and so there's still caves dotting that region that they, they would use for a variety of reasons, including burial. It was in this hillside of tombs that the demonized man came out to meet them. And so it says in verse 2, when he had come out of the boat, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit. Matthew, Mark, and Luke all record this encounter. I mentioned already that Matthew mentions two men. Mark and Luke concentrate on just the one. Mark tells us that the man met him out of the tombs and he had an unclean spirit. When you read your scripture and it says he has an unclean spirit, that is a demonic spirit that possesses him and drives him to physical impurity. He's possessed by evil spirits and these spirits drove him to do evil. They tormented him. His body, his voice, his mind was under the control of the demons. Satan is the prince of the power of the air. Satan, the scripture says, influences the present world system. In Ephesians 2, 1 through 3, it says, And you, he, speaking of God, he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. So Satan is the prince of the power of the air, and he influences the present world system. He uses his influence to construct a system that resists God and promotes error. He's the one who is the father of false religions. Paul spoke of how we all once conducted ourselves in the lust of the flesh. In 1 John 2, 16, it says everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, the pride of life comes not from the Father, but from the world. You see, in a general way, Satan already wields great influence over the world, but demon possession is more personal. Through this, he invades an individual's life, and when he does it, he tears it up. As we study this passage, we can begin to wonder, how did this man become demonized? How did it happen? Many wonder if possession still occurs. Others wonder if they can be possessed. The answer is yes, possession still occurs. If a person's open to it, demonic possession can and does occur. The other question, though, people ask is, can a believer be possessed? Can a Christian be possessed? And the answer to that question is no. When we're born again, we become the temple of the Holy Spirit. In 1 Corinthians 6, 19, it says, Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own. In 1 John 4, verse 4, Little children, you are from God and have overcome them, for he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. In 1 John 5, 18, we know that everyone who has been born of God does not keep on sinning, but he who was born of God... He who is born of God protects him, and the evil one does not touch him. The evil one does not touch him. This man was demonized. Christians cannot, but this man was demonized. How had that happened? He wasn't a believer. He more than likely opened himself up to it. That's how that normally happens. He wasn't just walking down the street and suddenly, but he opened himself up somehow to it. And now this man is severely demonized. It says in verse 3, who had his dwelling among the tombs, and no one could bind him, not even with chains. As we view the passage, we see things that reveal how deeply tormented this man was. 
And as we do so, we have the opportunity of seeing how Satan treats those who serve him. You see, Jesus spoke concerning the fruit of following after Christ in contrast to following the evil one. In John 10, verse 10, he said, The thief doesn't come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. But I've come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. So the demon... The demons destroy. Satan intends to destroy, but Jesus intends to, to bless. So what is the fruit of following Satan? Well, notice verse 3. It speaks of him dwelling among the tombs. What is the fruit of following him? You can end up living in a neighborhood you never thought you could live in. He lived in the tombs. He lived in an area where graves are carved out of the hillsides, or the cliffs. This man had become comfortable living among the dead instead of the living. Living in the cemetery reveals to us that this man was completely defiled. The law of Moses taught that Jews could not come into contact with dead bodies. In Numbers 19.11, it says, Whoever touches the dead body of anyone will be unclean for seven days. So this man became comfortable living amongst the dead instead of the living and was defiled. Luke 8, 27 tells us, for a long time this man had not worn clothes or lived in a house. So you can lose all sense of morals. This is one who roamed about completely naked. So that gives to us another insight, and that is it can lead to a shameful life. He'd lost all modesty. He lost any sense of shame. He had for such a long time lived naked and was constantly exposed to natural elements, and he had gotten used to it. And so it's easy for a person, if they continue to move in a certain direction, to become uh, um, used to it and normalizing it as if that's the way it's supposed to be. It's interesting how when Adam and Eve had sinned, they put on clothing to hide their shame. But this man had no shame, and the unclean spirit reveals sexual perversion. So here's something for us to know, that Satan wants you to no longer feel embarrassment. Satan wants to remove any sense of modesty from us. Satan wants us to become comfortable living inappropriately. I don't know, this sounds so old fashioned. I'm thinking something I didn't put in my notes and I'm thinking if you say this you're gonna sound your age. People are going to say, oh, that's just an old goat up there talking. All right, my brother. Another old man. <laughs> yeah, might as well. Here's, here's the thing. We, we are absolutely living in a time when there's, there's very little shame at all. People don't seem to know what it means to be embarrassed. Many of them don't seem to feel, wouldn't even understand what it means to blush with embarrassment. Modesty has gone out and immodesty is the norm. And, and, and I don't say that with a judgmental spirit. That's why I hesitate to say it. It's not like I'm judging people. I realize that, that we are slaves to fashion. I realize those things. It's not like I'm saying every person who dresses immodestly does so with the intent of, um, of, of being just an evil person. I'm not saying that at all. So I, I didn't prepare my thoughts well enough, so I'll just kind of share them. Hopefully they'll make some sense with you. You know, we had two daughters. We have, I think I have eight granddaughters. I'm in hell. No, I, um, <laughs> estrogen hell. Um, I, my daughters will tell you this, you know, I, I remember one in particular, one time when one of my daughters was about to leave and as she was walking out the door, and she was a young teen at the time, I said, where do you, where do you think you're going? Well, I'm going to go out. And I, not like that. What do you mean not like that? I said, well, not like that. Go and change. 
you know, as as a as a father, you know, I noticed those things with my with my girls and all. And but my girls seem to think that um, that that all boys are is they're just, um, you know, they thought that boys were thought like girls. They they did. They thought boys think like girls. You know, I don't know how girls think. God knows I don't. I've been trying to figure the mother out for years. I don't know how how women think. But I do know that men are different than women. If a, I've said this before. If a woman came walking into church wearing a bikini, well, that's inappropriate. We'll change it. If a woman's wandering around in a thong at the beach, one, one woman may look at the, the girl with the thong and say, that, that color of that, that bathing suit doesn't go with her complexion. I promise you, Boys don't notice complexions. We, we don't even know. We don't even know they have faces. Because we're different. You know, and God made us that way. I'm not saying he made us to, 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 that way to sin. I'm just saying that, that men are more visual. That is so true. I don't know why people keep arguing that it's not. It is so obviously true, you know. But And so sometimes fashion... Fashion that, that young ladies wear, you know, it may be in fashion, but it's also immodest. And, and, and I really believe that, that one of the things that we need to learn and, and, and as a society come back to is an awareness of stumbling other people. Because sometimes the young ladies will say, well, if you, if you get stumbled, that's your fault. Well, no, it's not my fault. I, by the way, you know, as a man, I, I told, I've told Marie, my wife has said, you know, when I got saved, I didn't go blind. I still notice things. I have to die to things the way anybody else does. I have, to, I have to avert my eyes the way Job said, that he trained his eyes that he might not look upon a young woman. You have to learn to. You train yourself to. You avoid things that are going to cause a stumbling to you. You have to do that. But I'm telling you, that immodesty is so normal today that people don't even think about it. I mean, you look at commercials, and my wife will be, will be watching TV. She'll say, I can't believe they're selling. And there are things they sell on TV, and women in their underwear and things like that. And, and Marie gets all stumbled. And me, I say, yeah, I know, I'm taking pictures. No, I, 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 <laughs> I say, that's right. You know? And so what happens when the enemy gets hold of you? Let me get to the point. What happens when the enemy gets a hold of you? Like he got hold of this guy, all sense of modesty left. There was no more shame about himself. This society we live in has no shame. When was there a day when you would have a homosexual parade and people would actually think it's a good thing? We have no shame. There are things that are being done in public that people think is normal. We have no shame. And that reveals the demonic influence in our society. And when Christians point it out, we're looked at as being everything but what we are, which is right. There is a certain awareness that you need to have of your body. The thing that, uh, that happened with Adam and Eve is when they fell, they got a sense of awareness and shame. And they clothed themselves to hide it. But this man has no shame. And this demonic spirit that is going to be speaking in a moment, it's actually more, is going to reveal, it's being revealed as an unclean spirit. It's a spirit of sexual perversion. And so Satan wants you to no longer feel embarrassment. Ephesians 5, 11 and 12 says, have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. It's shameful even to speak of those things which are done by them in secret. So modesty is to be held in high regard because it reveals our understanding of our own dignity. And with this in mind, God uses nakedness as a picture of shame and humiliation. Isaiah 47.3 says, Your nakedness shall be uncovered. Yes, your shame will be seen. In Revelation 16.15, Behold, I am coming as a thief. Blessed is he who watches and keeps his garments, lest he walks naked and they see his shame. Somebody once said this to young ladies, raise your hands and touch your toes. If anything shows, go change your clothes. <laughs> I like that. That's funny. <laughs> anyway, I better move on. Notice in verse 3 and 4, no one could bind him, not even with chains. 
This one had extraordinary strength and would watch for people walking below him. He was tormented and pushed to violence towards others. They were so violent, according to Matthew 8, 28, no one could pass that way. And people grew to have a tremendous fear of him. They avoided him. But he had tremendous strength. Years ago, I had a pastor's conference. Many years ago now, Pastor Chuck came out and called for several of the men because something was taking place. And Rawl was one of them, Rawl Reese and Mike McIntosh and some of the other guys. And off they went. Because a woman had shown up just up the road from the uh, campsite and was demon-possessed. And Raul was talking about it and was sharing how that he walked up behind the woman. Mike McIntosh was walking her, and they were walking her towards the church because she actually came to a church. The police had actually called us because they knew that uh, there was a pastor's conference. And so they said, can you come and help us? There's something going on. We, we don't know how to deal with. And so Chuck had called a few of the guys, and off they went. Mike McIntosh took the woman by the arm, and when he took her by the arm to kind of lead her, they were going to take her into the church so they could have a quiet place to pray for her, he said, in the name of Jesus. When he said Jesus, she went crazy, and she began to swing, and, uh, and Rawl, who is an eighth-degree black belt in Kung Fu, Rawl jumped on top of her to bring her down, and she was swinging him like a rag doll. Talk about power. And so... They get, you know, they eventually, I should finish the story, shouldn't I? They, they eventually prayed for her and cast a demon out of her. And this is a woman who was involved in a satanic cult and had sacrificed her own child. This is how evil it is. But Rawl, who is, who is a master, was being just, he said it was the hardest thing in the world to get this woman down. Because as small as she was, like five feet, five foot one, as small as she was, the power that she had, the strength she had, he said, was incredible. Just swinging, he said, she was swinging me around like a rag doll. This one had, they had extraordinary strength. It would, he would watch the people as they walked, and, and he would go towards them violently. So we know that Satan encourages anger and hatred towards others. He'll never, never encourage compassion or love for others. Notice in verse 5, Night and day, always. Night and day, he was in the mountains, in the tombs. So his torment is constant. There's no break. There's no time that he can rest. And in verse 5, it says he was constantly crying out and cutting himself with stones. Demons intend harm. They ultimately will push you towards self-destruction. Later on in Mark, in chapter 9, verse 22, it, it speaks of a demonized boy, and it says, often he has thrown him both into the fire and into the water to destroy him, because if they can get you to kill yourself, you'll be lost forever. So this one's been driven by incredible torment. He wants to destroy himself. His, his existence is unbearable. He's trying to end it all. He cuts himself with stones. The people had attempted to control him. They could not free him. But notice verse 6, when he saw Jesus from afar, he, he ran and worshipped him. So he came running up to Christ, and he fell on his knees before him. It's not the worship of a believer. What it is is the recognition of a greater by an inferior. He wasn't worshipping him from faith, but from fear, because the master was before him. What men could not do with chains, Jesus did by his mere presence. And he cries out in verse 7, What have I to do with you, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? Well, the obvious answer is nothing. You have nothing to do with me. Now, one of the demons is speaking. It's probably the leader, if you will. And then goes on, I implore you by God that you do not torment me. For he had said, Come out of the man. Now, though there are many, the demon speaks as the leader. The demons were trying to soften their inevitable end. They, they recognized Jesus for who he was, and they're afraid. They knew there's an appointed time awaiting their final judgment. They wanted to remain in that area. They want to continue their, their evil practices. And so in verse 9, Jesus speaks, and he says to them, What's your name? And he answered, saying, My name is Legion, for we are many. My name is Legion. Why would you ask his name? Because it revealed the depth of evil that this man was in bondage to. A legion, a complete legion, 
was a little less than 7,000 soldiers. And so this man is in terrible bondage. It also reveals his total authority over a horde of demons. And so as he's asking him, and he says, my name is Legion, for we are many. In verse 10, he begged him earnestly that he would not send him out of the country. Now a large herd of swine was feeding, feeding there near the mountain, so all the demons begged him, saying, send us to the swine that we may enter them. They're desperately trying to find a way of staying out of the abyss. They see a great herd of swine and seek permission to enter. And so verse 13, at once Jesus gave them permission. And the unclean spirits went out and entered the swine. There were about 2,000. And the herd ran violently down the steep place into the sea and drowned in the sea. I was going to tell you a joke. But I'm thinking this is too serious to call it the Bay of Pigs, so I won't. Deviled ham. Okay, going on. There's no reason given for why Christ allowed this to take place, by the way. He simply did. Perhaps they hoped that when all of these pigs were lost, that the owners would reject Jesus Christ because they knew that people care much more for their material comfort than their spiritual well-being. And there are people who have, by the way, said things concerning this, said, well, look at what Jesus did. He destroyed their livelihood. We need to remember Jesus didn't kill the pigs. The demons did. Jesus' mission was to save the man. The loss of the pigs was no comparison. And so as this is taking place, verse 14, those who fed the swine fled. And they told it in the city and in the country. And they went out to see what it was that had happened. It was so remarkable that those who had seen it had to go out and tell other people what they'd witnessed. According to Matthew 8.33, those who kept them fled and they went away into the city and told everything, including what had happened to the demon-possessed man. And so in verse 15, they, they came to Jesus and saw the one who had been demon-possessed and had the legion sitting and clothed and in his right mind and they were afraid. What they see is, is a man who at one time who had been so fierce that he would break chains, so filthy, so he was completely naked and violent. And what they see is a man sitting clothed and in his right mind. The man is resting in peace. He's resting in comfort. And this is what the Lord can do in a person's life. He removes torment. He can, remove a ra he can produce a, a radical transformation. At Revelation 21, 5 says, I, I make all things new. And that's what the Lord does. The Lord, will, the Lord will bring you to peace. And he removes the bondage, the pain and the suffering, the embarrassment, the shame that you could have felt. He removes those things. And you can be seated in your right mind at the feet of Christ. We have people in this room right now, people who are watching online, people who are outside, people who understand what this means. Salvation is not something that occurs where you simply become a religious person. Salvation is an experience with God where he sets you free from that which you were held bondage to. It causes you to actually be seated in your right mind. It causes you to actually be able to think clearly. It actually results in a place of peace, a place where you're no longer in the torment. You're no longer going through what you had gone through. You're now set free. You know, when you look around today, there are a lot of people in torment. There are a lot of people who are not in the right mind. They're being told a lot of lies and they're believing these things. They're, they're, they're following after these things. You know, I was sharing with Marie this morning just how that, you know, years ago I, when I began to share and I was sharing different things on different subjects on occasion, I, I, I remember sharing something about the, the, the fact that, and, and I'll use this illustration, uh, I, I shared something uh, about the fact that, that there has been no 
discovery of a, a homosexual gene. There are those who, who have uh, professed that they have found that there has been no discovery of a homosexual gene. It is a learned behavior. That was accepted for, for centuries. It was a learned behavior. It's an expression of human nature in that particular way. It's it, human nature being what it is is evil. And as we resist the things of the Lord, we can do a variety of things. Some people become thieves. Some people become liars. Some people become good at a variety of things. Homosexual being homosexuality being included in that. So there is no such thing as a homosexual gene. And I pointed that out. And I said, at this time, I said, I said, I can say that I am a six foot eight Swedish basketball star. And, and it was just to make a point. I said, but obviously, as you look at me, that's ridiculous. I'm not that at all. And I was just making that. But today, I could say that, and there'll be people defending my insanity. It's true. They will defend that. He has a right to say he's a, yeah, but am I a six foot eight Swedish basketball star woman? You know, everybody in this room believes what your eyes tell you. So it takes a lot of education for you to go, to bl go blind. You have to be warped to begin to think that way. Now, what I just said is politically incorrect, but it's true. You have to be warped to believe that way, to think that lying to somebody makes them feel better, therefore it's a good thing, is wrong. The truth sets you free. Lies keep you in bondage. We know that. So there could have been a committee there in the Gadarenes, you know, the, the committee for keeping people demonized who could have gotten mad at Jesus. How dare you set this person like this? Look at him now. He was happy as he was with the chains and the cutting and the violence. And look at what you did. There are people today who would argue that. But this man's there he is, set free, sitting at the feet of Christ, the one who set him free in his right mind, fully clothed. And that's what Jesus Christ does. He brings peace into our life. He transforms us and makes us the way that he wanted us to be in the beginning. And that's what the Lord will do. He removes your torment. But as this is taking place, notice verse 16, those who saw it told them how it happened. So a testimony is given. Yet they didn't even give him the respect that demons did. In verse 17, they began to plead with him, depart from our region. Get out of here. To their hurt, the demons asked if they could stay, but the people wanted him to leave. They cared more about their money than they did about their eternity. And so in verse 18, when he got into the boat, he who had been demon-possessed begged him that he might be with him. However, Jesus did not permit him, but said to him, Go home to your friends. Tell them what great things the Lord has done for you and how he has had compassion on you. And he departed and began to proclaim in Decapolis all that Jesus had done for him and all marveled. This man of power had delivered him from torment. This is one that I will follow forever. I want to go with you, but Jesus says, No. I want you to go back and tell your friends, tell your family, tell those who know you. This is how evangelism takes place. You share with those you know. It's interesting because as I was reading this, I began to wonder, how many friends did this man actually have? They must have known him before he became demon-possessed. They must have been grieved over what had happened. But now he's been touched by God. He's now a visible witness of God's power to deliver. And that's what you are. That's what you are. Keep that in mind. You were known for something prior to coming to Christ. You were known for something. Now, maybe you were a great person. I, I pray that all of you were great people. But I wasn't a good person. I was the opposite. I was the opposite. You know, the, the embarrassment, the shame to my parents, the embarrassment to the family. The liar, the thief, the drunk. That's what I was. And many of you were too. And worse. And then God touched you. And then God washed you. And God cleansed you. And God changed you. God transformed you. God renewed you. He, he made you brand new. So much so that 
When your friends saw you seated in your right mind, they thought, no, this is an act. This isn't something real. I know this person. This person can't possibly be this. That must have been an unbelievable experience for them to come and see this man who had been so violent, so powerful, still there, just but now clothed, now in his right mind, now speaking normally. It must have really just shaken them to the core. And you would have thought, you would have thought that these people who saw this would say, oh my goodness, truly God is amongst us. But instead, they say, get out of here. Because a lot of people like their sins a lot more than they want salvation. They like the life that they're living. They enjoy it. You do those things because you enjoy those things. I remember somebody told me, well, you take drugs because it's your way of escaping. And I said, you're wrong. I take drugs because I like it. I get drunk because I like it. What do you mean? I'm not doing something I didn't want to do. I'm doing these things because I enjoy doing these things. What's wrong with you saying I'm escaping? What do I have to escape? I just enjoy it because that's what happens when you sin. You get used to it and you begin to enjoy it. That's what happens. That was my life. I did what I wanted to do, but I was not I was not somebody who had peace. I was not somebody who had joy. I was not somebody who had love. Those are things I knew I needed, but I didn't have. And that's what happens when Christ came into your life, came into my life. He gave me those things I didn't even realize I was I was missing. And then I'm in my right mind, and then there are people who say, what happened to you? And now I can do what this guy did. I went to my friends. I told my family. I let people know. And if there's anything that needs to be done right now is the church needs to wake up again and evangelize again. We need to share with people that Jesus Christ is coming soon and that he's transforming lives. We need to do that. We need to be aware of these things because the church is seeing all the evil and we think it's going to overcome. It cannot. All you need to do is turn on a light and the darkness flees. That's what happens. And open your mouth and share. And don't, who cares if they like you? Who cares? You know who does? Jesus. Jesus loves you, man. He does. I'm, and that sounds so corny, doesn't it? It does. I mean, I'm saying it and it sounds corny to me. But it's true. But it's true. God loves you. God loves you. God has transformed your life. Why wouldn't I tell somebody about that? And I want to know more about him. That's why I am in church. That's why I encourage you to come to Bible studies. Get involved. Get into the word and give away what God has given to you. Because that's what this guy did. That's what he did. Look at what God has done in my life. Who are you? Well, you know that cave over there? That's where I used to live. You see these clothes? I didn't wear them. You see how clean I am and now my skin is healed? I don't, I'm not filthy anymore and I don't slice myself anymore. Oh, you can't be the same person. Oh, I am, I'm not really the same person. No, because I came into contact with Jesus Christ. He made me a new person. And not only does he share with his friends and all, notice again he began in verse 20 to proclaim in Decapolis. That's the 10 cities, all that Jesus had done. He did it, he shared it with everybody. He was touched by God. He became a visible witness of the power of God to deliver. And he proclaimed this, everything that Jesus did. Again, it began with his family. In Luke 8, 39, Jesus says, Return home and tell how much God has done for you. So the man went away and told all over the town how much Jesus had done for him. He went and told people. In verse 20, he departed and began to proclaim in Decapolis. In Psalm 66, verse 16, it says, Come and hear all you who fear, and I will declare what he has done for my soul. That's what you do. Come and listen to what God has done, and I will declare what he has done for my soul. That's all you need to do, guys. That's all you need to do. Once I was blind, now I see. Once I was lost, now I'm found. Once I was dead, now I'm alive. And Jesus Christ did that. Once I was addicted to drugs, now I'm set free. Once I was an alcoholic, now I'm set free. Once I was sexually promiscuous, and now I'm no longer. God has made me into a completely brand new person, completely different. And let me tell you about the glory of God. That's witnessing. And the church needs to wake up in this dark hour because the enemy keeps on saying, you're, you're lost, you, you've lost, there's nothing you can do. That's a lie from the pit of hell. That's a lie from the pit of hell. 
Yes, I can give a message that sets people free. Yes, I can live as a free individual. Why? Because he loved me, gave himself for me, gave me a new life. He set me completely free, and now I can follow him with joy because that comes from Jesus Christ. And one of these days, and it won't be long, I will see him face to face. And one of these days, I will hear from his lips, I pray, well done, my good and my faithful servant. And I want to hear those words so much that I will live my life for him until that moment. And that's how it works, guys. The Lord can set you free. Don't forget that the power of God and the, uh, the forgiveness of God, it, it, there's not a single sin that you've ever committed, not a single sin that he cannot forgive if you turn to him. Don't forget that. And he can make you so different like this man here that the people who knew him best would say, this is an entirely different person. That's what Christ does. That's called Christianity 101. That's what Jesus Christ does. Father, I ask that you would work in us so that we might know these things. I ask that you would work in our lives in such a way that we would understand and believe these things. And Father, I do lift up every person in this room and those who are watching online. And I pray, Father, that you would work in them that newness of life that comes through forgiveness of sins. Lord, we yield ourselves to you now. And we ask that you would help us to be in our right minds too. And even as our eyes are closed and our heads are bowed, there may be some right now in this room that the Lord is speaking to. You need to get right with him. And I want to pray for you. If you're watching online, you could do this right where you're at. If you're here in this room or in one of the overflow areas, you need to get right with the Lord. You can. And if you're here in this room where I can see you and you need prayer, for that, would you raise your hand and let me pray for you right where you're at? Father, you see these hands. You know the reason why they're being raised to you now. In Jesus' name, I pray that you would reach and touch each person whose hand is raised to you, that you would wash and cleanse, and that, Father, that you would just right now by your spirit just enter, that you would fill them and make them brand new. Father, I pray that you would make them like you made this man here, brand new in their right mind, seated before you in peace, desiring to follow you wherever you go. And I ask, Lord, for that transformation to be complete, Lord, in Jesus' name. By faith, we accept and we will follow you. We will hunger for your word. We will hunger for fellowship with those who love you. We will walk with your spirit. And so, Lord, in Jesus' name, I ask that you would do this and be glorified. And we thank you and receive bless you lord you can put your hands down and jesus i ask you continue to move within all of us and before we close as our eyes are closed still perhaps there are some right now that are going through something and you know that your body is just rebelling and that then you're ill and you need a touch from the spirit and a healing i'm not a healer god is but i have felt the impulse to keep praying for those who are sick and if you, need a, if you need prayer for an illness you're dealing with, would you stand for a moment if you'd like prayer? Let me pray for you before we close. Just stand that I might pray for you. Father, you see these who are standing right now. Lord, you know their bodies. You know what's going on within them. I simply want to come before you and ask, would you please touch them? Would you bring healing to them, Lord, whatever the condition may be? I just ask that your healing power would right now settle upon them, Lord, and that this illness, whatever it may be, Father, that you would heal them. Because you are the healing God, we, we trust you. And we just ask that you would do it for your own glory. And we bless you and thank you. We receive by faith. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. You can be seated. And Jesus, I ask that you keep moving in all of us. In your name, amen. Let's all stand. Amen. Our Father, we bless you and we thank you. We ask that you keep working in us. Lord, there are very various times that we'll have opportunity to be witnesses for you. We want to be equipped to do that, and therefore we would ask that we would hunger for your word. And Lord, when given opportunity, may we join others, Lord, in, in Bible studies. So I ask that you would draw this fellowship back so that we can get into the word more, so we can grow more and have more to give to others, Lord. I pray for our Wednesday night especially, Lord, that you would begin to draw more there because I have such a desire to see people equipped with your word. So, Lord, in Jesus' name, would you move through us and use us for your glory. 
And in this we are very grateful, and to you we give our praise. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. together and sing one more song for the Lord today, church. We worship the God who was. We worship the God who was. We worship the God who is. We worship the God who evermore will be. You see, open the prison door. He the raging sea, he got it, holds the victory. church if you want tamales go outside to the courtyard they're selling them there for our youth ministries have a wonderful day if you need prayer come on up front now someone's going to pray with you right now up front god bless you church